So the, the goal here is to um, get um, different uh, disciplines, uh, different groups of uh, researchers, policymakers, etc., uh, together to uh, discuss the use and advancement of uh, income migration, uh, including, of course, then cost analysis, or as we often call it in Europe, cost benefit uh, analysis. And um, I will be very brief, but the um, society has, uh, since 2008, organized a conference uh, in Washington. And um, this, of course, means that uh, many of the participants at this conference are from North America. So we decided uh, in 2019 to organize a conference uh, here in Europe. Um, and it was actually organized here in Toulouse, at Toulouse School of Economics. And uh, we then intended to organize a new conference last year, but due to the situation was postponed, but it will be a, a conference organized this year as well. Calls are open, it will be online due to uncertainty. Uh, you have a link there to the conference, so please uh, check it out if you're interested in the, the European uh, conference by the Society for Fund Cost Analysis. Um, as I said, I want to be very brief so we can um, come to the, the main topic of today's talk. Um, you have links to information about the society and its journal, the journal of cost analysis, um, both on the uh, event page at the TC for this event and also in the chat. Uh, Stephanie will share uh, the links with you there. Um, so then regarding this uh, webinar, so um, after we held the European conference, we had a lot of positive feedback, so we decided to, to go on and, and hold a new conference, but we also thought it would be nice to complement this conference with an annual uh, webinar. Uh, and this is why we're here today. So this webinar is a joint event by the Society of Plant Cost Analysis and the Toulouse School of Economics, and it's hosted by the Toulouse School of Economics. And this is the first webinar. We hope it will be uh, an annual event. And based on the interest we have today, um, it looks like we, we can at least have it another year. Um, but I would like to mention that this is not only uh, the SPCA and the TC that are involved in this uh, organization. Uh, we have, with, well, we had, couldn't come up with a better names. We call ourselves the SPCA European Task Force. This was a joint um, work from discussions with Susan Shelton from Newcastle University, Massimo Florio from the University of Milan, um, Danny Helena from Pali Dauphin, Ben Christon from uh, SLU Ilmio, and Emmy Kinne from the Paris School of Economics. And I also uh, would like to express my, my thanks uh, from, from the society and from TC uh, to our panelists. Um, uh, colleagues at the UK at Treasury and the um, um, yes, sorry, um, and also um, people here at TC. And uh, but a special thanks to Stephanie uh, Racer, uh, who has really been the person who has made sure that we can uh, have this event. Um, so, without further you um, move on to the um, the webinar itself. So now I have an incoming call. That's not very optimal. Um, but the, the idea we here with, with the first part is to provide a little bit of a background, as I did, present the, the panelists, and then we will have the, um, the discussion of the review, the desktop that review, economics of uh, biodiversity. And it will be a discussion between, um, we hope, both uh, Professor Daskupta, who is with us, and uh, Professor Jan Rockstone, who will, I hope will, will join us uh, quite soon. And after that, we open up for a Q&A session. And uh, due to the high number of participants, we have decided that uh, at least as default, you will not be able to, to directly ask your question, uh, but you will have to share them in the Q&A feature. But that will also allow you to vote for each other's um, questions. So uh, you can signal your, your interest in different questions. 
And if uh, Yuan uh, Ostom is not able to join us, we will start uh, soon with this Q&A session. Um, and I would also like to mention that the webinar will be uh, recorded and uh, available on the TC's uh, YouTube channel. Um, yes. So I, I will go ahead and, and introduce both uh, Professor uh, Dasgupta and Professor Rockström uh, because I hope that uh, you one will, will join us soon. Uh, and I think it's still worth uh, uh, introducing him even if he's not here yet. Um, and they both have very impressive careers, but I will um, try to be as brief as, as possible because I, I know that you prefer listening to them than listening to me talk about them. So um, Professor Desgupta, he is currently the Frank Ramsey Emeritus Professor of Economics at the University of Cambridge. Um, his first uh, degree was in physics from the University of Delhi in 62. And then he obtained a degree in mathematics from the University of Cambridge before he obtained his PhD in economics from the uh, University of Cambridge. Uh, before joining the uh, University of Cambridge to become professor, he spent um, a decade and a half at the London School of Economics, uh, where he became uh, professor of economics. He also held a position um, as a professor of economics and philosophy uh, at Stanford University between 89 and 92. Um, Broad research interest, uh, welfare, development economics, economics, technology change, population, environmental uh, resource economics, fair games. Um, and of course, what's interesting here is that in 2019, uh, he was commissioned by the UK Treasury to lead a global independent review on the economics of uh, biodiversity, which is uh, why we're here uh, today. Um, several honors and, and awards. Uh, including his uh, elected fellow of the Economic Society, British Academy, Royal Society, the list is very long, uh, so I'm going to go on with that. Uh, several honor doctoral degrees, including Harvard University, and um, also he was named Knight uh, Bachelor by uh, the Majesty Queen in 2002 for his services to economics. Um, He's been very productive. Um, the list is too long to, to go through here, but um, he's been extremely influential, not only in research and academia, but also in uh, policy making. And this uh, seminar today, or webinar today, illustrates this uh, very well. Um, so, Yuan, I hope, will join us. He uh, is the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. He's also professor of the Institute of Earth and Environment Sciences at Boston University and professor of water and system and global sustainability at Stockholm University. Um, his first year was a master of science, University of Agriculture Science, Uppsala, Sweden. And then he also got a postdoctoral uh, degree in uh, Agronomy Approfondi at the Gandhi Kohl Institute National Agronomy Polytechnique. And then he got his PhD uh, from Stockholm University in Natural Resource Management. He's been executive director and he's also the founding director of the Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University. And he was the executive director of the Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, deeply involved in different research questions on Earth system global su sustainability uh, and how it, human behavior relates to economic, ecological impact. And um, He's also been, been heavily involved in, in policy making, providing guidelines or recommendations to European Commission, UN, et cetera. Honor degrees, awards, et cetera, uh, including a prize by Albert II of Monaco, 2020. And also uh, worth mentioning here, since we are in France um, in this webinar, the French Distinction Night of the General Honor in 2016. Again, uh, very influential both research and, uh, and policy making. So um, with that, I would like to uh, leave the floor to uh, Professor Sir Dasgupta, and hopefully we will have his uh, Yohan Yonius uh, soon. But uh, to kick off this uh, session here, uh, start with two questions. 
Um, so the review highlights the fact that humanity has consistently ignored nature in economic thinking. Why has nature been absent from economic models for so long? Would be the first question. And I, I pose the second question uh, immediately. Uh, in the review, you state that countries should move away from the use of GDP as a measure of economic success. Why is GDP inappropriate and what do you feel should be used as an alternative? And as I mentioned, uh, don't hesitate to already now uh, ask your question in the Q&A forum. And we start from there. Professor Soda Skupta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, the fir first question, it's um, yes and no. Some will claim it's been there. It's called environmental and resource economics, but that's not the sense in which the question has been asked. I think the question is not denying the presence of uh, existence of environmental and resource economics, which looks at specific um, resources, could be uh, wetlands or, or whatever, and try and tease out the uh, accounting prices for them. Uh, that's been long and running for quite some time, but I don't think the question was really addressing that. It was denying it, but it's asking something really substantial, which is, how come they don't enter into models of growth and development, which influence our conception? When I say our, I mean citizens' conception, not just economists, because we are influential. We economists are extremely influential. Their conception of what is possible in the future. Uh, why, is, why is that the case? I can't give you an answer because I'm not a historian of economic thought, nor do I study these matters for that well. I'm a research scientist. And, but I can give some, th some hints at where I suspect the answer lies. The psychological reasons I cannot tell. One possibility is that we economists do not have a biological background. We come from math uh, a lot. Uh, we are, it's not as though we economists are narrow-minded. We are very uh, open to new ideas. Uh, behavioral economics is an example of that. In about 15, 20 years, it's taken over. It's now a, a very, uh, enlarged part of economics teaching and training. Uh, but again, that doesn't require an awful lot of understanding of nature, of, of uh, psychology either. Uh, you can create a subject out of not knowing what the subject is about, if you like. And, and I don't mean this pejorative <laughs> in a uh, critical way. I mean, it can, you know, you can have real progress without really delving into psychology or looking at behavioral anomalies. That's what happens. And I think nothing like that has happened because ecology is a uh, new subject. It's really a post-war one. I mean, there are mathematical models, Lotka equations back, way back, but the hardcore ecology is an empirical science. And thank God it is because it's a very hard empirical subject. And I think it's roughly speaking 70 years old, if you like. You know, certainly in 1950, if you asked, uh, is there a textbook in ecology? And wouldn't get it. Um, the famous Ehrlich, Ehrlich Holdren textbook is called Eco Science. It doesn't call it ecology. Uh, so that's one side of it. It's new, and we don't have a uh, background in it, we economists. However, the structure of ecological models is so similar to economic models that it's hard to understand why we didn't move in that direction. But that's leave that aside. It's not a new phenomenon that it's absent from economic models. The classical political economists, as far as I can tell, didn't have nature in it either in their models of the stationary economy. Ricardo had land in it, in his model, but land was indestructible. It was a fixed factor and which could not be degraded. And the whole point of the review, my review is that nature is destroyable, not just degradable. So we're looking at say, regenerative resources, which can be uh, degraded. Uh, but then the classical political economists didn't have technological progress either. So they may have talked about it, but their formal models were all about the stationary state where uh, it was neither nature nor technological knowledge. Now in the post-war period uh, from 1950 onwards, when growth and development economics took off and was defined, for some reason, we kept nature out, but put technological progress in. Well, maybe not immediately, but certainly, certainly Solo's model didn't have technological progress. 
But let's say by the 60s, 70s, technological progress was brought in pretty explicitly as an, as an engine of economic dynamism. So you lost the dangerous part, the part that could sink us. You kept that apart, but you brought in all the optimistic parts, the things that could propel us. And so that's given us a very, at least in my judgment, an extremely distorted view of what is possible. It's distorted because it ignores some fundamental facts about the workings of the biosphere. And the, the review that you're asking about, uh, we're discussing today, is not really so much the economics of biodiversity, because biodiversity is really a characteristic of ecosystems. It's really the economics of the biosphere, the biggest subject that there is. So it's something I was very excited about when I realized that what I was writing on was the economics of the biosphere. You can't have a bigger subject, this subject than that. So I enjoyed writing it a lot. But there's a second question, so I'll address that as well for further questions are asked. Um, it's a very, it's, it's, it's today, I think, quite a commonplace that GDP is in inappropriate measure of economic, the state of an economy. And you can see why if you're a mathematician, because GDP is a flow. It's say so many dollars of output, final output per year, let's say. So it's a flow. Whereas the state of an economy is not a flow by definition, it's a stock, it's a state variable. So if you want to describe an economy by its state of affairs, what is it like now? It should be an inventory, st statement of the inventory of the economy. And the inventory consists of capital stocks, assets. And uh, connecting with the first question, the assets that we're looking at in, in growth and development economics, and that has influenced national accounting in a big way, um, are human capital, more recently and produced capital in previous generations. So we have this essentially a study of produced capital and human capital, both of which can depreciate, but the assumption underlying feeling is that the depreciation rate there is bounded because, I mean, how, I mean unless you, of course, if you have a war, you can have a huge rate of depreciation, but in peacetime, basically the depreciation of a building is well, you can manipulate, you can excessively use it and depreciate faster, but it's not gonna be like cutting down a rainforest in, in five days, if you see what I mean. So GDP is gross domestic product. So we already have a problem. We're looking at gross figures, not net. So depreciation is not included. On top of that, and rather to bolster that, is real problem is that you can have GDP growing up while you're mining the, mining the biosphere in order to bolster your growth eating into it. And if you can do that, um, then you can have growth of GDP while your productive base is shrinking and you won't know it because the national statistics aren't giving it to you, except when ecologists keep on complaining or NGOs, environmental NGOs come complaining. But then you don't take them seriously because you say in retort, say, well, okay, you're talking about small matters. The main thing is that progress means GDP growth and we're after it. So economics itself, if it's used well, if we're honest with our profession, with our subject, and it's a great subject, it's been develop, developed by some of the greatest minds of all time, Smith and um, Ricardo Marx, and in our own time, people like Kenneth Arrow, I mean, these are giants of, so what, what they've given us is an amazing grammar. And we really need to not belittle the subject, but possibly criticize the way we practiced it. So what the review does is to talk about progress measured in terms of stocks, inventories. And the hallmark of the idea is to think of a representative index for that. And the theory of economic theory tells us precisely the connection between intergenerational well-being and inclusive wealth, wealth including, which is not just produced capital, but human capital and natural capital. Of course, measured in accounting prices, not in market prices, because of course the whole problem with the economics of biosphere is the fact that nature is not priced well. In fact, it's 
has a zero price in many cases, even though it's a scarce good. So I'll stop there. Uh, the, I hope I've responded to the two questions adequately. But if, there, if it hasn't, I apologize, but you can ask some subsidiary questions if you like. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to announce that, that uh, Professor Oxum has, has joined us. So he will also address both a question and I will uh, stop sharing so that instead of seeing my slide, we can see the, our two panelists uh, a little bit more. Uh, so please, Professor Oxum, floor is yours. Yes, thanks, uh, thanks, Henrik, and and um, great to to see you, Partha, and uh, hello everyone. And, and let me start by, I mean, we haven't talked, Partha, since since you released uh, um, your review, and just to congratulate you for what, what I would argue to be the the most significant economic analysis for humanity's ability to navigate our future in the Anthropocene we have at hand so far. So this is. In my mind, the guide to the future. So I, I really, you know, congratulate you uh, on behalf of humanity, basically. Um, on on the two questions. So just to complement your your reflections here, I think from a, from an Earth system scientist perspective, on on question one, why why has nature for so long been been disconnected from economics? I think apart from, from your really important points about you know, the disciplines being kept apart, I think incrementality has a significant uh, part of, of explaining this, that for basically the entire Holocene, uh, the last 12,000 years since we left the last ice age and, and shifted over from hunters and gatherers through the Neolithic revolution into the journey that has taken us to modern civilizations, we have been a, a very small world on a big planet. And, and we have not uh, collided with the biophysically hardwired processes that, that, that leads to your conclusion, Partha, which is that we have a finite earth. We have allowed ourselves to, uh, to basically exploit the earth system as if it was infinite because we were a relatively small world on a big planet. And the impacts were largely incremental they were largely local. And moreover, the Earth system tended not to send invoices back. Uh, there were some local invoices, but very rarely connected invoices. So, so we could trot along, and, and scientifically, we show that we could trot along all the way to the point of the Great Acceleration, which starts as recently as in the 1950s. So it isn't until the 1950s that we shift over from being the relatively small world on a big planet to turning into the large world on a, on a small planet. We're starting to hit the ceiling of the hardwired processes. We've reached what my predecessors, the head of the Potsdam Institute define as a saturation point. We basically exploited all the fish species in the ocean. We cut down uh, so much forest that ecosystems started to be unstable. We did what you point out in the report, tip over freshwater systems from our oligotroph to our eutrophied systems. We start hitting planetary boundaries. And I think that is in a way almost like a defense line for almost like a, to, to explain how could economists for so long allow themselves to, to be blind to, to natural assets. And, and I think one explanation is this fact that, that we could go along quite successfully in this incremental world. The, the, the second um, potential explanation is something that you spend uh, is a chapter three, I think, on on nonlinearities. I mean, you're you're I mean, you're, you're you're a champion among world economists of explaining nonlinear dynamics and then bifurcation points and hysteresis. And as you know better than any economist in the world, that's where Earth system scientists are at heart: the recognition that the Earth system is a complex, self-adaptive, interactive system characterized by multiple stable states and nonlinear dynamics and thresholds. Now, that has come to the fore in terms of scientific evidence very recently. I mean, it's only the last 10 years, basically, that we have the unequivocal evidence that we can actually put so much stress on Greenland, on the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation of heat, on West Antarctic, on the Amazon rainforest, and so on and so forth, 
then we can actually tip them over into irreversible shifts that would lead to a dramatic shifts in, in your accounting scheme for economics. So I think that that as well has been a very important one. And then finally, I think that the most important sentence in your review, if, if I can pick a favorite one, and I, if I may, Henrik, just to quote that line from, from your chapter six, we move away from the viewpoint that has given rise to the paradox, your paradox that, that uh, built on the fact that we thought humanity to be external to the natural world, seeing us dipping into the biosphere for its goods and services, transforming them from our production and consumption, and then discharging the residue into the biosphere as waste. The review, your review, is in contrast built on the recognition that humanity is embedded in the natural world. And I think this transition from us being disconnected to now reconnecting is also an explanation why we haven't seen the integration between the natural and the, and, and the social world. So I think those are just complementary explanations on question one. On question two, I don't have to add anything more just to say that it's so much music in the ears of an earth system scientist. I mean, as you know, and you, you have a whole section on this, earth system sciences has come to the conclusion that we need to define planetary boundaries. Planetary boundaries means setting quantitative scientific targets that define a safe operating space for humanity's future on a stable and resilient earth system. That in turn translates to budgets. It translates to stocks, stocks of fresh water, stocks of phosphorus, stocks of nitrogen, stocks of carbon, stocks of land, stocks of assets in the living biosphere. So I think we have a fantastic breakthrough point in terms of realigning through what I call strong sustainability measures, pathways for economic development within a stable earth system. So I, I think that is a really, you know, as, as an earth system scientist, I've read your report like, like the most um, inspiring uh, document in, in my professional uh, life, to be honest. And, and I'm not saying that because I have you in front of me. I'm saying it objectively. This is, this is significant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Uh, your explanation was better than mine, by the way. So <laughs> the, certainly over the first question, that was, but they're complimentary. Very complimentary, exactly. I mean, that's uh, no, I think there's a very, very significant meeting point here. And I can tell you that I've been sitting down as, as recent as yesterday with my co director, Professor Otmar Edenhofer, uh, a fellow economist of yours. And, and we are seeing for climate science the significance of your economic review on biodiversity. So there is, you, you, you're so right in emphasizing that, that your report is in economics for the biosphere, it's not in economics for biodiversity or just uh, local ecosystems. It is for the, for the system development. Thank you very much. I think one, one minor observation I would make for, for our economics colleagues who are listening in is that what is uh, to an academic or any scientist really pleasing is the convergence of findings in the earth scientists on the one, in one extreme through ecologists through environmental scientists and to a few, uh, two demographers, and then to, to a few economists who work on this. We have different tools, we look at different measures, but they all are converging or have converged to one stri striking phenomenon, which uh, Professor Rock Rockstrom has just alluded to, which is that if you plot the state variables in each of these disciplines, if, and I'm being vague now here, but if you, each of the disciplines will know which, what I mean by their state variables. Then they're pretty much flat, right through the whole sea. Okay, a little bit of increase perhaps rise from the industrial revolution onwards, not surprisingly, but roughly speaking at the end of the second world war onwards, it's really taken a leap. You see that in the climate literature, of course, the, horse, the famous hockey stick, but that reappears in a variety of guises in all these disciplines, which is really nice because it's telling us that you can cut into the problem from any end you like, and you will have a meeting point with the others. Yeah, no, I, I think that is, um, that's a, 
you know, and it's taking us a long time to, to, to come to that empirical evidence. I mean, it's, uh, that's also something that I often need to remind of that it isn't until 2007 that, that the first package of observational hockey sticks are truly published and put in place. So again, we, we can't explain why it's taken us quite some time to come to these deeper, deeper insights actually. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not an excuse, but it can explain that it has taken us some time. But now there's no excuse because now we are standing on this mountain of evidence. So, uh, but, but one more question to you, uh, Partha. I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, one of the challenges that I think we, we see on the horizon if we would implement your economic thinking in full in terms of having a, a stock-based asset definition, which actually leads to the conclusion that there is not an infinite growth in GDP terms on a finite planet. How do we address the next 10, 20 years in terms of lifting the majority of people out of poverty? How, how, do, we, what, what, how, how do we deal with the social distribution of wealth in a finite earth where we are sharing the stocks in a very unequal way? Very good question. Of course, I, you know in advance, I won't have an adequate answer to it, but we can only chip into it because each of us has reflected on this in, in our own way. But I think first thing we ought to avoid thinking in terms of is a redistribution of wealth as as we currently measure it. Um, it might be a better idea to remove so many of the distortions which are staring in our face. So let me give you one. We uh, thrive on the idea that we are living in a globalized world, increased trade. And if there's one thing that unites economists in general, it is the virtues of international trade. Opening up trade enhances everybody's well being. But the theorem is correct only if you assume that all goods and services have ideal prices. We forget that when we deploy the theorem for practical policy purposes. And why is that important? It's important because much, because of the distribution of ecosystems, much of our, if you like, natural wealth lies in the tropics, one type of natural wealth, say a tropical rainforest, if you want to use as a simple example. Certainly a great deal of biodiversity lies in the, um, in the tropics, which also happen to have some of the world's poorest countries. Now, think of a straightforward example. You have forests in the uplands of a, uh, wet, uh, of, a, of a watershed and you're deforesting it because you need to export, you want to earn foreign exchange, you cut down forest trees, export it. But you do not compensate for the fact that there are losses downstream. Okay, I do not need to elaborate on what the losses would be. Now these are externalities, but you're not compensating for it. Therefore your price you're setting for your exports is lower than the price, the cost that you're actually bearing as a nation which means what? Something very, very ugly, which is a transfer of wealth in our sense, in the sense that we are discussing here, from the poor to the rich. So we have many of these distortions to get rid of. If we do that, I think the idea that there is a conflict between poverty alleviation and minding our home, nature that is, uh, that, that conflict is attenuated. Now, to be sure, there will be some give, give that we have to make, but that give will only come if we price our goods correctly. So, for example, when we fish in the open oceans, we are not and nobody pays a rent for using the oceans for as a fishery. Nobody owns their ocean, an open access resource, and much of the fishing is done by rich countries because they have the equipment to be able to do that. You know, big trawlers and so forth. So again. You have a distortion, you what we don't pay the appropriate price for the fish we eat. See, if we can get rid of these one after another, these distortions. And on top of that, of course, there is about, the review said there's a four to six trillion US dollars worth of subsidies we pay ourselves to eat into nature. 
So that's a really, I mean, you've got a negative price for nature in those cases, okay? So if you start saying, it's not a question of us giving to the poor, we just pay up for what we consume. Well, of course we'll consume less, goes that same, because demand functions are downward slope. So if the price goes up, we'll consume less, but at least we'll be doing it honestly. That is to say, we shouldn't then complain that we're happy to do, do this because up to now we're not paying for it. Mm. I think that's how I would begin addressing that issue. Uh, this is quite a, over and above any question of redistribution because they're poor and so forth. That's happening anyway, foreign aid, but I'm not talking, we're talking, responding to you in the language that you've introduced here today, which is, how do we manage the biosphere? The plain truth is we are treating it as a free good. Yeah. A lot, largely as a free good. But do you think, um, I'm also, I mean, we're in the super year 2021 with, with three UN summits lined up. I mean, we have the Kunming Biodiversity Summit in China. We have the UN Food Systems Summit, unclear where it will be geographically. And we have the, COP26 in Glasgow, the climate summit in November. And uh, in the run up to Kunming, there is a quite, quite an exciting and very relevant movement towards trying to ramp up the, the, the policy targets on protecting nature, uh, going from the 30% uh, you know, safeguarding on terrestrial and marine ecosystems to even uh, considering a 1.5 degrees Celsius equivalent that we have on climate for nature. And that's such, a, such an apex target for nature would be essentially net an, a net zero loss of nature, basically from now onwards, which of course is impossible to accomplish because we're losing biodiversity at such a high rate, but that it would be a starting point to start measuring against. And you put a lot of, F, you put a lot of emphasis on, on the need to measure to be able to then come to an inflection point by 2030, which would be defined as a net net positive point, resurfacing and then moving towards a restoration future by 2050. Now, do you think that economic incentives, like putting a right price on natural assets would be enough to, to sort of say, turn around at this urgency point that, that we see that we're in right now? Or do we need strong political regulatory means as well? Or how do you see that mix between regulations and economic incentives to, to turn around the asset management on, on natural capital? It's a very good question. And the, you might expect my answer, anticipate my answer, which is you really need both. Yeah. I think of regulations as really a very extreme non-linear pricing system, extreme form of it. Somebody says that this is a protected zone, as they say, a 30% protected zone. It means no entry, mm. which is another way of saying you have to pay an infinite price to enter it. So when I use the pricing, the word pricing, I have in mind the range from linear prices, prices independent of quantity, to quantity constraints. And good economics tells us that for these hugely non-linear systems, the kinds of boundaries that you yourself contributed to thinking about, uh, and uncertainty in their location. That's extremely important. We know that the planetary boundaries are there. We don't know where they are. So you better be very careful because you cross, if you enter into that, you, you know, it's not going to be funny. Mm -hmm. Okay. So take those two things into account. And a third ingredient, which is nobody knows everything. You know certain things, I know some things. If I'm the regulator, I know some things, but I don't know your activities. You know your activities better than I do. So the companies who are cutting down rainforest have more information, or societies who are living in rainforest, they have more information about the rainforest than the regulator does. This asymmetry combined with uncertainty and nonlinearity gives us a potent reason for going in for regulation. That's an extremely important reason. I mean, a purist will say it's not really regulation, it's a very, very highly non-linear tax or something. Okay, well, that would, that's, that's just being pedantic. The idea really is that, you know, for all practical purposes, yeah, that's exactly right. I think that's the, the scenario you uh, portrayed is the kind of thing we ought to go for in this, these meetings. 
Um, but they will have to have it simultaneously. And the thing is that it operates, I was about to say it may be that at the global level you need quantities, but at the local you don't, but that's not true. You need it even at the local level. Mm. And in fact, local communities have practiced prohibitions all over the world. The anthropological literature is replete with examples of fishing uh, uh, communities, farming communities, um, who have instituted local norms of behavior regarding what they can take from the neighborhood, when, how much, and so forth. I mean, some of the literature is just amazingly rich. I mean, you can take uh, leaves from this plant in this part of the year, but not that type of part of the year. And this kind of plant in October, that kind of plant in November. I'm making up the number, the dates, but it uh, can be as rich as as richly detailed as that. But these are all regulations. They're not saying if you pay a price, you can take the leaf from you. So we are used to regulations. Societies in the past have been, even for their local ecosystems, as you rightly pointed out, local communities have suffered from biodiversity loss. It's not a new thing. Uh, distress migration is a symptom of that. So I think we need to have both payment for ecosystem services is, is a kind of market as a pricing mechanism. So that's where you have a pricing system. So if I'm benefiting from your land, which is your the river that flows through your land is cleaning, uh, doing things for me, then I pay you for something. Well, that's a price. But at the same time, at the same society, there will be certain types of controls over use. So I think it's a mixture, no question about it, in my judgment. Yeah. And then one, I, th I think one question that that um, is is on many people's mind uh, when when one starts understanding the fact that basically we have been subsidizing our our GDP based growth for 150 years plus from from basically exploiting for free assets in the planet and and that this is simply has come to the end of the road. Then of course. The immediate worry is, oh my God, what will that mean to the cost of our lives? And that the number one question, of course, is food. Because if you look at the at the relative net share of incomes, particularly in, in the in the more wealthy parts of the world, uh, food has become relatively cheaper and cheaper and cheaper over the last 50 years, thanks to the fact that we've become more and more effective in overexploiting natural capital, which has been done at zero cost. If we now start pricing that capital in the right way, food prices must rise. How do we handle that without having uprisings a la, a la you know, Gilles Jaune in France or, uh, <laughs> or the, the origins of the Arab Spring even that were connected to food price, uh, exponential rise of food prices in Cairo, for example. I mean, how, how do we handle that, that risk? Well, the, that's a very good question. Of course, in poor countries, that's going to be, uh, you just have to have countervailing uh, payments to soften the blow. Yeah. But let me put it the other way too, in terms of what happens in the rich countries. Uh, it's let's say 10% is what you spend on food. Let's say people like being you know, rich people. Um, and we're subsidizing food. And notice we waste about a third of the food that's produced. So it must mean that we'll, we are underpricing it. If we can waste it, it's, yeah, but a thirty percent uh, is approximately the figure that I, I picked up while writing the review. And one of my colleagues picked it up, one of my, my team, and we have a chapter on food prospects. So again, it's a question of whether we're willing to pay the price for what we actually consume, and we've been living off on the cheap because we're not paying for it. Now, of course, if that same price or some transform of it hits a poor household, we're in uh, trouble, but then you just have to compensate for that, for that. And there are so many ways in which we have methods of making that compensation. But the, but the underlying point is not that we are, I think we just need to persuade ourselves that the logic of the science of biodiversity or science of the biosphere is telling us that we have not been paying for the goods we consume. Uh, and that's the first step. And then the onus should be on the objector 
to say why we should carry on when we're not actually paying. And how does that, how does that marry with that same objectus, objective of looking after his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and leaving behind a, a dynasty which can thrive rather than which goes under? So these things we all have to face up to. So there has to be some adjustment. We can't, you know, we can't have it, you know, there's not one of those situations where every, everything can be made better off at the same time because we've started in a very distorted world. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a very interesting uh, reflection. No, thanks. And so, so then, Parte Fame, I'd like to, to drag you back to, to an encounter between the two of us that I'm sure you don't remember because I, I was... Um, I was a young, younger researcher at the time, and um, uh, it was in the run-up to, to, the, to the last time there was a similar review, uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, and that is when, when uh, Nick Stern came out and was working with, with the Stern Review, and then we got the first assessment on the economics of climate change and the assessment of the costs of action versus inaction. And as you recall so well, and I was actually in a, in a in a meeting in Cambridge, where where there was a debate around discount rates, and uh, and and Nick Stern was was defending a lower discount rate, while the conventional economists were arguing against that. And I think it was in a sideline, but you might have made it publicly. Actually, you you, you made the statement, as I if I recall it right, that if you have nonlinearities, I mean, if you have tipping points, and you thereby go from incremental cost to infinite cost then you must be open to consider negative discount rates, that, that you could actually have a situation where you need to value the present even more than the future because the risks are too high. Are, are you still standing by that conclusion? And, and, and are there any new insights you derive from, from, your, from this review in, in that regard? Yes, thank you very much for asking. It's a, it's a, um, yeah, I'm fairly settled on my views on this. And the settled view is that um, it's not a platonic answer. There's no objective notion of a social discount rate. It, it's, it's built on many ideas, but let me try it out. I'm still sticking to that idea. First of all, the methods that have been used to the discount rates that have been used, at least let's, let's be vulgar and say across the Atlantic on climate change, economics of climate change have on the whole taken the view that you can tease it out of market interest rates, okay? Now that's really bad economics. I mean, literally, this is just flat bad economics. Why? Because it's based on the idea that you can mimic an entire economy as a rep by representative household maximization problem. Now, in some ways you can do it, but the world that will look be suit that transformation, uh, is wildly different from what the data are telling. So why is that a bad idea? The, I, the reason is, well, the counter argument could be why not? Because each of us cares about his children or her children, and they know that our children will care about their children and so on down, down the dynasty. Uh, so by recursion, you are interested in your, you're taking into account your, all your children, or all your descendants. So, okay. So if you have a representative household, it's okay. Their behavior doesn't. The problem with it is that you, Johan, may be taking that line through your dynasty. I may be taking that line with my dynasty, but I won't be taking that line with your dynasty, and you won't be taking your line with my dynasty. And we are looking at a world with externalities. That's the whole reason you're discussing economics of climate change, your biodiversity loss. So therefore, the market outcome, decentralized outcome, will be thoroughly uh, and you could easily show that the discount rate should be lower. So that part I'm very happy with in the move that Nick did. The trouble I had with Nick's was that it's a very absolutist view of Nick, of, uh, of, 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 of uh, ethics. And it says that ideally you do not wish to discount future generations just because they happen to be in the future. The problem with that argument uh, is that like any other moral principle. It can clash with other moral principles that you can you probably hold. 
And to have say that one moral principle overrides or trumps every other moral principle I have can get you into serious trouble. Yeah. Now, in a great series of papers, the late Jalin Kukmans showed that to treat all generations equally on their welfare space, okay, um, in a world in which there is an arrow of time, which is mimicked by the productivity of capital, the fact that if you plant a seed, it'll grow. So tomorrow that seed will be but bigger than what it is now. That fact, that yield can lead to paradoxes in assuming it can lead to very unequal treatment across the generations. And I take that very seriously, that result, because it's telling me that never, but never be so monotheistic as to say, this is the one principle I hold, because if you hold it, you can run up into a world in which it's giving you the reverse of that. That is, you start with assuming that you're going to give equal weight to everybody, and the answer is treat the generations extremely unequally. Mm. So that's why I, uh, the entire review is, at least that chapter, opens up that pragmatic view of ethics by saying you should really, we should do what we do elsewhere in life. You, you trial and error, you choose a discount rate and see how it works and it comes back and so forth. And finally, you're absolutely right. The discount rate that you were talking about is not over time, it's over consumption. Mm. And there, um, certainly, when you face a possible dip in consumption because you're hitting against, then certainly you would be wanting to have a negative discount rate because there's a risk that tomorrow I'll be poorer than I am today. So a dollar tomorrow in goods is worth more to me now than a dollar of that same good today. So yes, very much so negative. Um, yeah. You can you can just just imagine what what a signal it would give to to global markets if you would put put a reasonable floor price on natural capital and negative discount rates where there's scientific evidence in support of the risks of of losing out uh, in consumption over time. I think that would be a a, a tremendous um, you know that would be a bifurcation also in in, in in the evolution of economics. I have a final question to you before handing back to Henrik for, for an open Q&A. And we, we both have, um, you know, uh, friend, colleague, uh, the late Nobel laureate, Elna Ostrom. Uh, you, you referred to, to her work in, in your review on polycentricity and how to govern the commons. And uh, this is one of the things that I'm spending a lot of my my research time on today, how, how does the planetary boundary framework with an earth system scientific analysis translate into new principles for governance of the global commons? Because it's not only that the planetary boundaries translate to, to natural stocks, it also translates to, to the tipping element systems, the big biomes that you talk of so, so eloquent in the review, that, that contributes to regulate the state of the planet. So let's take, for example, the Amazon rainforest, the, the richest habitat of biodiversity. How can we, I mean, we know that that is a natural asset that has uh, national borders that we need to respect. They are actually integrity points for, in this case, the Brazilian's economy, for example, if we take that part of the Amazon. But at the same time, we know that we all depend on the functioning of the Amazon. So, so there is a commons um, factor here. How can we, through, through your economic kind of approach or, or paradigm in, in your review, handle that? Handle the, how, how would we do that? Is there an economic mechanism here? Would you, would you advocate compensating Brazil in one way or another for providing that commons service to humanity or how how could we go about saving the amazon as a commons for humanity while at the same time respecting the brazilian national integrity well i'm so glad you asked me this question because i would have sneaked in the answer <laughs> my response even if you hadn't asked me the question <laughs> it's not something that i expect to see happen in cop 15 but i wish it had uh, maybe it's too late maybe we're not bold enough but if you think of what happened at the end of the Second World War, when uh, countries where nations were bold enough to have a Marshall Plan, 
the United States was generous enough to construct, consider the Marshall Plan, which resurrected from the ashes of the Second World War Europe. Uh, and then had the, uh, the nations had the generosity and, uh, to, and vision to institute the, establish the World Bank, IMF. These are global, these are it, transnational institutions handling global public goods. In the one case, reconstruction and development, that's the World Bank. The IMF, financial stability, which both are global public goods. Okay, so these are in transnational institutions. So one of the recommendations, which I don't foresee happening, but it's certainly worth, certainly there's no way I could not propose it. Economics tells us that somebody has to something, some institutional arrangement must be made to protect the global commons, whether they're in the, um, na confined to national, um, uh, to within geographical borders, as in the case of the peatlands or the uh, rainforest, tropical rainforest, or whether they're open access, yeah. like the open oceans and the atmosphere. Now, I think the moment you think about an international institution, immediately people say, oh, it's gonna to be too costly. Who's gonna pay for it and everything? I'd like to argue that if you combine the rainforest, the case that you just now mentioned, with the open oceans, then there is a possibility such an institution could actually collect, if it's collecting rents from the open access resources, because then now it's governing the commons. And then compensating for the peatlands and the rainforests, because they're within national boundaries. Obviously, you need to compensate. The logic says so, because they, they have the right, quote unquote, to do what they want with it, and they have a vision of what they, they're doing, and they can legitimately say, okay, that's fine. You're telling me I shouldn't cut it down, but on the other hand, I do have some needs. And let's assume that it's an honest expression, by the way. I mean, just because they say so, that their development requires this, I, I don't have to believe it, but never mind. That's, that's how it is. When two people bargain, there will be a lot of jockeying and posturing. I mean, we're not exactly, I mean, politicians in particular should be used to that idea. You and I may not, but certainly political leaders should be. So leave that aside. The logic says, yes, we should collect rents for the use of the open access resources, global open access resources in this case, and then also subsidize the protection of the global commons, which are within national boundaries, okay? And very, very crude calculations, and I would not wish to be in record in saying that I said so. Very crude calculations suggest there would be a huge surplus. Okay. I mean, there's a hell of a lot of ocean out there, and they're extremely, uh, we are using it to, you know, all the stuff we are shipping, you know, ship, can you imagine the containers that are going back and forth through the Atlantic Ocean and Pacific and so forth, plus the fisheries. Well, fisheries are smaller, small beer relative to the transportation. But if we start rent, charging rent, so when I say we, an international institution, so what the, to summarize, your in, in, instinct is exactly right. Good economics says, yes, we have to compensate. That's called payment for ecosystem services. We practice it in small areas yeah. of discourse. And that's what you're suggesting for the larger ones. But on top of that, we should be charging for the open access resources, make them no longer open access. But yes, so long as you pay. And if there is an international agency we can trust to do that for us, that would be an enormous gain. And unfortunately, we haven't gone that route for climate change, you see. In climate change, there are all these estimates of the social cost of carbon, all right, social price of carbon. But the question arises, who is going to set that? Is it based on the whole world? Let's say somebody says it's $100 a ton. Is that $100 a ton to be collected by a transnational agency? Or do you say to all countries that $100? Well, then nobody's going to pay, you say, because uh, different countries are in a different state. So it leaves me a bit worried as to why we didn't go into the direction of a more, more imaginative construction, institutional construction. Instead, what we have is agreements about, oh, it has its virtue, by the way, the idea that you the earth, ask the earth scientists, what are the, where are the boundaries? And let's say they say 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial. Let's say that, okay. 
So that's a quantity target now, globally. And you say, well, we're gonna work within it. So the next question will be, how do you allocate this constraint onto the various countries? And of course, that's exactly what's been happening. Each country takes a pledge, let's say, mm. to limit the contribution. And then works out a tax, let's say, which will be required in order for that country to be able to match. And that tax will be national tax, as it were. And that has a logic as well. Certainly, I can see a logic in which that happens. But when I read that $100 a ton is the tax of social cost, I don't understand it because I don't know who is actually imposing it. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's, that's an incredibly interesting and intriguing suggestion, actually. So one could think of just like the high seas institutionally being entrusted to exactly. basically take out a, a cost for, for using that free public, global public good, you could entrust the atmosphere to yep. an institution and who we trust and to collect the tax for, for the pollution that we're causing. And we distribute that to, to the vulnerable communities. and Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's an... A good suggestion for President Biden and uh, Ursula von der Leyen. And, um... But it won't, it won't fly. It won't <laughs> even get to first base, as we call it. <laughs> it won't come to first base. Well, but you know, the, the times, they are changing, and we're in a turbulent world right now. So all, all good ideas need to be put forward at this, at this moment. But thank, thank you, Partha. I'm giving back to, to you, Henrik, for, for the... Well, kind thank of... you so much, Johan, and good to see you. Yeah, lovely to see you as well. I'll, I'll be continuing to join to the end here, but... But I know that there are many, many questions uh, from, from the Q&A. So thanks. Henry. Thank you, Johan. And thank you both of you for this very nice and, and very interesting um, lot of food for thoughts here in discussion. Um, yes, we have many questions. Um, so I will actually um, try to be a, bit, a little bit efficient and give you two questions. So. The two questions that's been um, seen out here as the most uh, popular question are two slightly different questions. And the first one is about uh, the comment or observation that economic thinking has ignored nature and it's from uh, Susan Shilton. And what he, she says is that the discipline of ecological economics developed explicitly to address this issue. And in the early 2000s, there was real excitement I worked at the University of York at the time, Sue uh, mentions. Why do you think it gained less traction than might have been hoped? Were these thinkers just ahead of time, or is it something more fundamental? So that's the first question. Why didn't ecological economics have a larger impact? The second question is from uh, Nicola Tresh. And um, different question. Um, there are millions of species on Earth. But welfare criteria only consider one species, ours. That sounds morally dubious to ignore other species, especially sentient animals as a source of welfare. Browsing an early stage of the otherwise excellent report on biodiversity, I essentially saw nothing about this issue. Why? Question mark. So those are the two questions I... Well, first of all, thank you very much. Um, First, it's very hard for me to answer. I'm not a sociologist of thought, so it would be impertinent on my part to say why ecological economics suffered. Uh, I should say that from about 1991, one small group of uh, ecologists and economists and earth scientists have developed a very powerful relationship, which actually Johan and I were alluding to. Uh, he came out of it, actually, himself. Um, uh, from, from 1991, when the Bayer Institute for Ecological Economics was reinstituted, reconstructed by the Swedish Academy of Science. And Carl Juran Mailer was the first um, director, and he was an economist. So the deputy director was Carl Kolke, who is an ecologist. And when Carl Juran retired, uh, the directorship passed on to Carl Folke. Uh, so, and now the deputy director is an economist. So it, it's entirely the scientific board has always had 50% ecologists and economics, economists in it. And when I say ecologist, I include uh, people who have been involved in serious nonlinear uh, studies of nonlinear systems, including earth scientists in particular. So I'm talking about, say, let's say biospheric scientists and 
the human economy uh, scientists. So it's been very productive. It takes time. It takes enormous amount of time and care. I was, it, I was uh, chairman of the board of the uh, Bear when it was initially first instituted. And there was no question, the first set of meetings, there was um, you know, some suspicion from each of the other. It's very natural suspicion, it's not nothing. But we didn't worry about it. One reason I didn't worry about it, I was much younger then, and that's why I was made chairman, because then the senior people would accept anything I said. There was no rivalry issue, you see what I suspect, because we had giants like Kenneth Arrow and Paul Ehrlich and uh, Simon Levin sitting together and Bert Bolin. They were all um, on the board. And with their, with their authority in place, there was no problem of any. And it has really blossomed. I, I can assure you the number of papers that have been published in PNAS, Science, Nature, uh, with the, the authorship of these, of this, these, dis, these disciplines together, you know, 20, 30 names at each time, they have made an impact, no question. You can't simply say this is a fringe activity because the people who are involved in it are mainstream, uh, you know, powerful people in the mainstream of their disciplines, like Levin, for example, or Arrow. These were people who were uh, as mainstream as they can be. So get, don't give up hope. It's been happening, but it hasn't really penetrated the economics profession in their teaching. And that has to be accepted. I mean, in other words, I can't deny that, nor would I wish to deny it because this is something that I really care about and I feel very disappointed in. I can't, you know, even my, my own department doesn't have anything remotely resembling what I do. And it's not that they don't like me, they <laughs> like me enormously. I mean, we are friends and uh, I was chairman of the department, but we don't have it. So I don't know how to answer your question, but don't, don't despair. There is a seriously good work that's being done by some seriously good people from these disciplines developing ecological economics. And I like to think my review is a reflection of that. Uh, the Resilience Center, for example, was something that many of us from the Bayer Institute promoted and, uh, and I made it happen. The second question is really hard in the sense that I don't quite know how to uh, write about it, but we do allude to it. Uh, in the review, no, it's more than illude. There's a whole set of sections. There is um, economists have looked at this issue in at least those who have studied valuation techniques for natural capital have looked at it primarily, initially, of course, in terms of the use value of nature. Not so much species, but use value of nature. So if there is a wetland, what's it doing for us? Let's say being a habitat for birds and bees and so forth, who are pollinators. So you look at the thing as it production function way, okay? That's the use value. Then a number of economists uh, in the 1980s and 90s asked the question, what about amenities? They don't have that, that kind of a use value. There's no market for it, but we use it and we get pleasure out of it. Uh, how do you value that? So you look for existence value and you, these are usually done by questionnaires. You ask people how much you're willing to pay to ensure that the flight path of these geese is, is, is not disrupted. Now, there are problems with answers, but at least you're trying to get a sense of how people value these remarkable features of the biosphere. These flight paths, for example, thousands of migratory birds, thousands of miles. No, it's a phenomenon. You can't see, you know, this is mind blowing how it's what's happening. And you want to know how much you should pay to protect it. So that's been taken into account. Um, and the moment you ask for that, you really looking a little bit towards species. There's a whole community of birds who are doing this, family of birds, and you're trying to protect them. Then there are, of course, societies are cleverer than we, uh, academics, by the way, a lot cleverer. So there are societies where every society has sacred aspects of nature. We all have them, but it's not a, it's not a uh, prerogative of traditional societies. Even we in the West <laughs> feel that certain things are sacred, don't want to damage them. So what do you do? You do exactly what Johan was hinting at. You don't price it. The whole point about it being sacred is it's priceless. <laughs> you, you ban use of it. 
So you protect it. Uh, so there's a good deal of that in the review as well. And I think the codifying that is something that can only happen from a citizen's demands, in my judgment. A society says this is sacred to us. But before I finish, I should say that bear in mind that the world is a very wicked place because of all the demands that are made on us. And yesterday I was pointing out to the example of the Ganges River, which is a holy river to Hindus. I mean, as holy as it can be, she's a goddess. She sprang out of the locks, through the locks of the Lord Shiva. And uh, some like 500 to 600 million people live in the Hindu Gangetic Plain. People bathe there to cleanse themselves and so forth. The whole works is there. And yet it's the most polluted, one of the most polluted rivers in the world. We dump everything in it. We Indians dump everything in it, okay? You name it, including dead bodies, you know, just dead chemicals and so forth. How do you come to terms with that? And uh, I've been reflecting on it. And when I was writing the review, I reflected on that. And I, point, I realized that we all come to terms with it, even in sophisticated societies like ours. We rationalize it. So a good Hindu would say, and has been known to say, that no, we're not polluting the river when we throw chemicals into it. She's unpollutable. She's a goddess. So it's okay. And then I asked myself when I was in my middle years raising children and busy with my work, there's no question I neglected my parents. They lived in India. Weeks went by, this is long before the internet. Um, weeks went by, I hadn't written. Telephones were bad, really bad connections and so forth. So it could be months that we didn't. I used to feel very guilty. Now, how do I salvage my guilt? Well, they will understand, of course. They know I'm busy. Well, that satisfies or at least cut, balances the book, if you like. But the fact is, parents, I can't, be, I can't think of a more sacred agency than the parent. parent. So I was, I was in the same dilemma as people who are polluting the Ganges. So, it's a complex thing, but we accommodate these things and do the best we can. Thank you very much, Yuan. You want to add something? Yeah. No, the, the only thing I could do, because you were referring to, to the Bayer Institute and to the Stockholm Resilience Center, to, just to confirm um, your, your assessment here that, that ecological economics has accomplished um, perhaps more than, than, than is really out there in the, in the, let's say, the most public domain. But I would also like to emphasize that even though it goes too slowly, uh, things are happening across the whole economic uh, discipline at large, I would argue. I mean, we are, for example, working quite actively with, with uh, you know, very conventional business schools around the world, building in planetary boundary thinking and the Anthropocene basically reconnecting economics to, to the biosphere in conventional economics. You have the whole donut economics uh, movement in the world right now, trying to get the economics to function within planetary boundaries. I mean, there are, I, think, I think we shouldn't uh, uh, dismay too much. I mean, one can definitely still argue that we're locked in, in a paradigm, which is still disconnected uh, to refer back to your review. Partha, and, and we still have a, a way to go, but but we're at least moving in, um, in in a you know I think I think more aligned direction with regards to the Earth system challenges we're facing. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned donut economics. So I would actually ask you three questions now. So one question was actually on donut economics. So. How relevant do you find this uh, concept to be? So that's uh, from an uh, anonymous attendee. But then uh, I would add two other questions related to a growth. They are the, the most popular comments at the moment. Um, so uh, you have addressed growth a little bit before, but um, I would still ask the question because that's slightly different from what you discussed before. So the first one is from Eric Owens. Uh, we talk about growth and development in poor countries, but our bio system are already stressed with the current standards of living as we see around the world. For those in developing countries to increase the standard of living to those of us in OECD countries would create additional strains on our system. How can this paradox be addressed? 
And the second question related to growth is from uh, Scott Farrow. While I'm part of the core in agreement, this reminds me of the limits to growth debate in the 60s, 70s. Economists then tended to argue that substitution was ignored and substitution along with price changes would avoid limits to growth. Is the new biosphere economics message any different than limits to growth? So those are the two questions on growth and then there was a donut question. At the start. Thank you very much there, uh, Fabi, if you want me to respond to them. I suppose they are related, of course, all of them. Um, let me try and answer it in a different way. I mean, it's, you can, you can always say it's, you know, you can track any idea back to something else before. And the, uh, the, the, uh, the bite lies in whether it's rhetoric or whether it's really backed with measurable, concrete, scientifically based um, objects. So uh, some time ago, I was responding to the, uh, to the idea that the, I was suggesting that the classical economists, political economists did not have nature very much in their, uh, in their, they didn't have nature in their models, in their implicit models, nor did they have technological progress. And I think Johan gave an extremely good answer as to why they could, they could avoid the first because you know, small scale and so forth. So that's, that's fine. Um, what we took away after the war was the technological absence of technological progress, but we didn't put in the nature side. That's something I mentioned before. So we have to counter that argument. Simply to say something is a donut or a cycle circle doesn't mean very much because you can think of an expanding donut, you can think of an expanding cycle. So in some deep sense, you have to argue against the idea that human ingenuity on its own can keep us out of the planetary boundaries, keep away from the planetary boundaries by being in ingenious, if you like. And the models that we've had, including natural capital, they the models that I worked on with exhaustible resources. Have, you, if you have an exhaustible resource, that's the only one, and it's an essential exhaustible resource in the sense that without it, if it's zero, then the output is zero. Where you, you might say that's about as rich a model you can think of and the extreme model you can think of with a finite boundary. What did we show? We showed that if the substitution possibilities are sufficiently large, which is in this case, actually only one, a cop Douglas function would do, you could asymptotically go to zero stock, but if you have accumulated produced capital sufficiently fast, you're, you can have indefinite output growth. Okay, now the limits to growth is not gonna help you with that, those metaphors. That's the point. If you're a scientist, you really have to fight or if you address or argue against the best there is in your science. It's simply not good enough to say the biosphere is bounded, therefore the human economy is bounded. And you need to show something more. And what we've tried to do in the review, I think I like to think successfully, is through the balance, you know, the demand versus supply inequality, which Yuan was referring to before, is that the efficiency with which we can transform goods, nature's goods and services into final products, that's the conversion factor that depends on institutions and technology. And what you want, and what we argue is that just as you cannot have a, an engine which uh, transforms heat into work at 100% efficiency, you cannot have that efficiency parameter that I mentioned just now go to infinity. And if it cannot go to infinity, then we, even the human economy is bound. Now that argument is far in ahead of anything I've seen before. And that's why um, I haven't really alluded to the limits to growth literature and so forth. Because simply saying that the biosphere is bounded and there, therefore there is limits to growth can be easily countered. And I had to counter my colleagues, the best of my colleagues, not simply assertions. Um, that's enough. That's about as best, as good as I can, I, I can make it. Yeah, and, and I just like to, to, to support part of here also from, from an earth system science perspective to say that uh, I, I am personally agnostic to, to growth or no growth in the sense that we are all aiming for something else, which is human well-being. And I think, again, you, you spell out that very well in the review that 
you know, what, what, what everyone is aiming for is, is good lives for your own families and for your coming families and that we need an inclusive wealth metric <clears throat> to be able to measure our progress as human beings and as communities, societies in harmony with nature as we move along in the world. And that in, in that context, I, I do not see um, any direct um, limitation or, or contradiction between finite planetary boundaries and, and good human development, that we can have an economy that develops within the, the physical boundaries on Earth. And of course, institutions and technologies will allow us to, to have dynamic responses here. I mean, you have a very classic example of what's happening right now, shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energy systems can, can theoretically provide us with the same level of, of really good energy access in a modern world, but one is destroying the climate and the other one is within the safe operating space on the climate boundary. So, so I think there is, there is no, no real contradiction here, but we have to integrate both boundaries, hard boundaries with policy measures that put pricing on natural assets and, and that allows us to have an economy that, that provides the right incentives. And I think that's, that's the magic of that mix, so to say. Um, and then on, on the donut economics, for me, the donuts economics is, is, a, is, is more of a paradigm inspiration. It's not an operational tool. And it's largely uh, based on the same principles fundamentally as, as your conclusions part, I think, which is that our, our societies and economies must now evolve within the, the stability of a, of a functioning Earth system. So it's a, it's a kind of a bounded system in terms of the economy and societies evolve within the planet, meaning we need to reconnect. Uh, we cannot be an external component of, of natural assets, basically. And then where you take that operationally is, is a completely different story. Um, yeah, so, and then there was a question there on, on develop, developing country paradox, but, but I think that's a question that perhaps is closer to you, Partha. I think this is, comes, comes down to, to this uh, inequity challenge we have, that we cannot, how do we transition to a future where we don't allow a rich minority to basically vacuum clean the natural assets on Earth and not share in an equal way with the vast majority of, of poorer communities in the world. And I mean, that's, if anything, the grand challenge we're facing. I mean, the grandest of challenges, perhaps. And there's a good deal of truth in what you've just said. I agree with you. And some of my comments uh, previously alluded to that, whether we are paying for the goods we take from, the, we, we buy from the poorer countries adequately enough. But remember, we are looking at the wealth of nations. We're not looking at the GDP of nations and wealth will include, these will be national wealth expressed in terms of their natural capital. So you can have a world in which uh, the wealth grows for quite some time. But I keep mentioning that it's very important. You can have formal models, as I said, with exhaustible resources and uh, produced capital and human capital in which everything is kosher in the sense that without any of them, there will be no output. So there's the essential. And yet, accumulation of capital and knowledge can override the biosphere. That's it's really, I have to say, at the end of the day, you have to match the best of existing models before you can progress. Otherwise, uh, a, a critic of metaphors will say, OK, yeah, but here's my model. Tell me where it doesn't match your metaphor. It does, and yet I can show you mathematically that you can have the unlimited growth. So a great deal of my last 30 years has been spent in trying to do, essentially have a, a dialogue, internal dialogue with the best there is in economics, uh, which I still think is misguided and see how to meet that and remove the misguidedness, so to speak. And that does work, require work. A lot of work, and the review, I, in the review, I've tried to do that. I've tried to express that. So, do bear in mind, metaphors are good, but one reason they don't seem to be 
um, have an effect on the economics profession is they can come up with these counterexamples and say, well, all right. Um, so that's just a, just a reflection on my own experience, put it that way. Thank you again, both of you. Um, so we, uh, I think we can go on the, the whole day and all evening here, but uh, I think we need to uh, finish soon. So I will ask the a few last questions. Um, and the last one of those, I think, could be seen as a good ending point here. Um, so there is one question from, again, from Sue Shilton about evaluation. So we move on to maybe more practical uh, questions. So uh, Sue uh, writes that we have a well-defined framework to value human safety. So the latter statistical life, for instance, risk is fairly fundamental to this. And then she writes, this is not the case with environmental evaluation. Risk may be added empirically. This seems problematic to me. So is environmental evaluation fit for purpose? going forward, or does it need a fundamental overall to more fully encompass risk and uncertainty? And I had another question that's related to that from Monica Fultin Sarishta. Uh, do you think that the scale from monetary based valuation in policy planning could be an alternative path? Is it possible in your opinion? Could it reduce the pressure on economic estimates of GDP as we have today? So two questions on valuation. And then there is another question, um, is uh, especially for Professor Des, uh, Descupta. Um, if one were to begin analyzing some of the issues that you raise from global perspective to estimate costs and benefits, what would be the global social uh, discount rate that you would use? So that's, that's a very precise question. And then the, the question that I would say summarize everything here, uh, and also it's currently the one of the most popular one from um, James Hammett. What are the prospects for some form of green GDP becoming important in governments and policy making? So that's the Sorry. last question. Sorry, what was that question again? What are the prospects for some form of green GDP becoming important in governance and policy making? Well, thank you very much. I'll go the reverse direction, okay. Um, first of all, the uh, green GDP at one level, you're asking for deep, taking depreciation into account when you do your income expenditure uh, calculation. So it's N NDP, if you like, net domestic product, uh, taking into account depreciation of natural capital, which will be include environmental degradation. The problem is that increasing GDP, NDP, is not equivalent to increasing uh, wealth. Uh, because for wealth to increase, in, inclusive wealth, I'm always going to be in, referring to inclusive wealth here. Uh, for in, to, in, to, to increase inclusive wealth, consumption must be less than NDP. So you need to add that additional condition. Otherwise, you won't have in, net investment. And if you don't have net investment, your wealth doesn't grow. Okay. So carry your entire intuition about uh, changes in capital stocks, you know, the asset management problem that we economists are good at analyzing, but always include natural capital in it. And then you'll be, you'll be safe in your discussion. So yes, green GDP is the first cut, but it's not on its own going to give you the result you want, because the result says that welfare and wealth are two sides of the same coin. Uh, if one goes up, the other goes up. If one goes down, the other goes down. Okay, so that's the idea. Uh, social discount rate, you know very well, I can't give you an answer to that because the, the uh, social discount rate is the rate of change of a accounting price of the numerary good. That's the definition of a social, you choose your numerary good, let's say produce capital. Oh, it doesn't have to be produced capital, it could be something else. It could be some ecosystem, which is your unit of account. And you express values of everything else in terms of that. That's okay, that's just a choice of numerary. Usually we choose income or to produce capital, expressed in produced capital. And you, the social discount rate, in other words, the rate at which you're discounting this numerary good over time, um, depends on both economic possibilities and your welfare criteria. So without knowing the, the way the two marry each other, uh, you, you won't be able to get an answer. What the, the question that you had was asking as to whether it could be negative, was precipitated by the idea that, okay, what you do is you're looking, you make a forecast of the economy, projection of the economy based on the best model that you've got. And then you ask, suppose I introduce, include a new project, investment project. 
An investment project is really a perturbation of that projection, of that forecast. Because if you accept it, the economy goes in one way. If you don't accept it, it goes another way, but a neighboring, neighborly way, okay, in the sense that they're not very different. Okay. And then you ask whether that perturbation is worth undertaking. And what we usually do is to look at the net present value of the project, which summarizes the value of that change that the project brings about. If it's positive, you say, well, maybe we should accept it. If it's negative, you say, we'll reject it. But then ask yourself the following question. What does NPV mean? Well, NPV is the discounted value of flows of net benefits. And the sum of net flows is a stock. So what NPV, something we are very familiar with, is telling us is measuring the change in the wealth brought about by the project. So we've got a nice, complete story now here, welfare economics here. Uh, the only thing is when you do the NPV calculation, don't forget to include natural capital. <laughs> that's the project, okay? So that's that. I can't answer the social rate of discount any further, other than the fact that if your forecast tells you, and I want to go back to Johan's question, suppose the forecast that you have tells you that you were going to hit the planetary boundary or come too close to a planetary boundary in say 20 years time, okay? On the other hand, you're going to have a hell of a lot of good things coming out for the first 18 years of the program, okay? Then you have a project and you are thinking of how to think about that project. Well, because you will be on the 20th year, you're really in danger zone. You're going to have a serious negative discount rate, which will then amplify the, the losses you will be suffering at that age, that stage, when you bring it back to today. So instead of diffusing it, reducing it through a positive discount rate, the negative discount rate amplifies it. And so that will be a signal, don't go there. Don't accept the project. Try and avoid this path. Okay. That's the motive behind your hands question, because that's exactly right. And it says that if you follow economic logic correctly, you shouldn't go wrong, at least not in your intuition. You can still make a mistake, but that's a different matter. Um, the valuation issue, uh, well, there's very little for me to say. Um, there is, it's a, all I can say is that nothing is perfect. Everything is approximate, particularly when you do it for the first time, when the whole category of goods and services come to the um, national accountant and he has never, or she has had no experience with them. Uh, but then ask yourself, if you feel that despondent and say it can't be done, just ask yourself, what must have been like for Kuznets, Simon Kuznets in the 1930s to prepare the first set of national accounts. I mean, he was making horrible mistakes and he knew it, <laughs> that's the main thing. He was cutting corners left, right and center and he knew it. So the key thing is we have to take the risk. We have to go the right route. We'll make mistakes, but the good thing of having good theory is that you know what mistakes you're making, where you're making. You don't know the order of magnitude of the mistake, by the way, because you don't have that kind of information. But you know that you are, you, you're, being, you're being guided by theory to do the right modifications. And of course, over time, if you have the time, and that's where you had comes in, we'll say, well, look, we don't have much time. You could have trial and error and then make moves. And we really have to be very careful now. We need to engage hugely, the national accountants really need to engage hugely with earth scientists and ecologists. And one of the things that the review recommends is that every department of government ought to have ecologists in it, not the environment ministry, um, Bank of England, Treasury, they all ought to have it because every project should be screened for its impact on the biosphere. That's as practical a uh, thing I can just so yeah. Now the second question, monetary GDP, I'm not sure. The entire review is on the real economy. Money is just a way of expressing, uh, uh, we're not looking at short run management of the financial sector. We're looking at the real economy throughout. We could have, I express it in dollars or international dollars, but it really is, it's about goods and services. That's why I began by saying, we're looking at nature's goods and services, not the monetary value of it. That's that's an expression. It's a trade-off between the relationship between the processes that are driving the system and the economic system and the biospheric system. Thank you. I think uh, you answered all the 
questions. Uh, Yuan, would you like to add something? No, oh, these were very exhaustive answers. My only compliment would be on Sue Rai's question on uh, on evaluation as well on risk and uncertainty. Just just to add to to Partha's uh, assessment here of the need to recognize uh, or or to build in our ability to to handle uncertainties and and uh, really let's say operationalize precaution because we know that we are facing nonlinearities, but the risk remain uncertain but the interesting thing is that um, the way we generally define risk is probability times impact and if impacts are infinite in terms of being unacceptable then risks are high even at low probabilities so a low probability times a very high impact gives high risk that's exactly where we are now we're facing high risks and i would even define um, emergency or urgency as equal to risk multiplied by time. So an emergency arises when you have high risk multiplied by limited time. And that's exactly what we have come to. We've come to a point where we have a decade to turn things around to avoid high risk, despite uncertainties. So, so in that sense, I think it lends even more support to, to take to take your review partha and and start really broad conversations and try to translate it in, into policy measures and that precaution to handle uncertainty and risk must must form central stage also in our ability to to value natural capital and stay away from from what 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 I call the danger zones meaning transgressing the boundaries so again a very nice alignment in uh, from, from entering the channel we're facing from two very different uh, entry points. So. Okay, uh, I'd like to just have a, 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 a epilogue to your, the point you've just now made, which I should have made, but you've made it very eloquently and correctly, so that's not a problem. Um, you're, when zero meets infinity, we have a problem. And that's what Johan is rightly pointing to. It's sort of, those of you who are listening in and who are economists, uh, will recognize that the, this problem was faced by the 18th century mathematician Bernoulli from the St. Petersburg paradox is exactly this. And what, um, what uh, one of the problem when zero meets infinity, um, the you, decision criterion can't be expected utility because the data are so ambiguous. And there are there is work on the axiomatics of ambiguity. And that is to say, you, obviously relax assumptions that you made before for, for expected savages theory, uh, expected utility theory, because you don't have the kind of, you can't even have subjective probabilities because the data are all over the place. It's just very noisy, very calm. But you do know that it is. Uh, and then there are axioms. We give you something like a maxim in, for example, which is of course now comes back to these problems we've been discussing. If it's maxim in, then you don't talk about probabilities. You simply say, I'm going to avoid the bad, bad case like crazy. <laughs> you know, that's the, the, the least, you know, the trying to make. So again, we do have the tools uh, to do, do that. And in some ways we do use it. We have prohibitions. We, I mean, we just look at COVID. That's COVID, under, under COVID, we've given up a huge amount of individual liberty, which in the West we take for, we take as absolutely sacrosanct. That's our religion, okay? Why did we do that? Because there's a public goods problem here. And uh, we're at risk of you know, not having you know, lockdown and so forth. All the constraints that we've been facing the last year uh, are, are, are to avoid uh, spreading the disease. I giving it to you, you giving it to me and so forth and so on. So you've got a, a serious externality problem and we have agreed on quantity constraints to, to, uh, to meet it. So I think we need to, I'd like to think that economics is thus done best if we work on very tight models, but then step away from it and use life to illuminate the model, so to speak. And so you can get experience of COVID to say, yes, well, we've been giving up freedoms and, uh, and we've agreed to give up freedoms. We've done that in order to have better, higher freedom later. If, if that's the case. So we're not too far from this idea that if we're near these planetary boundaries, we are really in serious trouble, no question about it. 
And uh, that's all the sciences are telling us that. And we really need to think through the things that we need to give up in order to be able to have a prosperous future for our descendants. Thank you. Um, so um, as, as a share of, of this session, I would take liberty to ask one final question uh, for Parta. Um, just to, this is an, an important and very urgent question that my, uh, sorry, topic and that the re, uh, review is covering. So my, my question will be a little bit more uh, summarize the discussion and, and have your thoughts about uh, the future. So the UK government has said that they will respond to a review later this year. Uh, what do you hope can be done globally this year on this issue? So what's your hope that can be done? Well, the ideal hope, of course, the hope that I would have, which is completely unreachable, would be to all the recommendations that are carried out. But this was sponsored by the UK government and the UK Treasury. And UK is a powerful country, no question. But on the other hand, it's only one country. So it can't possibly be responsible for carrying out the recommendation, say, having a transnational, in, in, introducing a transnational, creating a transnational institution. It can at best, if it thinks it's a good idea, to advocate it and see where it goes. But there are many things that can happen domestically. Obviously, there are domestic policies and um, structural changes in the way, say, projects are appraised, even in the uh, treasury, would be something that the treasury could do. And I hope they will. I don't know what the there are political issues, political feasibilities, which of course, as an academic, I am not privy to, and I shouldn't be privy to, because if I took political constraints into account when doing my science, I would be doing really bad science. Uh, that would be just wrong. I should look for open possibilities and then see what, and hope that our, our representatives in government will carry through. And there are many other things. Uh, we have very strong things which we haven't discussed over here is population, for example, uh, which is really, which the review has quite a lot on, which is unusual. Uh, on environment, you don't talk about population, but it's absolutely central to the issue because it's one of the key variables affecting our total demand. And there are trade-offs between population size and um, standard of living. Uh, it's, it's, uh, that's obvious. Uh, but it, in order to show what the trade-offs are, you need models. Can't simply say that if you increase one, you have to reduce the other. You have to see how they respond to each other because these are endogenous variables in these models. And my review has that. And within population, there is a lot we can do. We can have a greater expenditure on family planning in foreign aid, for example, component of foreign aid, because uh, some of the, you know, we haven't fertility transition we may have gone through in the West and in China and in, in uh, Korea, South Korea and uh, Taiwan, but Africa is nowhere near a fertility transition. And there is an unmet need for uh, their need, not ours, the women's need. They're in dairy, they, they've expressed a desire for the need for family planning services. So we can boost that enormously. The EU can, but less than 1% of EU aid goes to family planning because it's a forgettable aspect of the home, the host nations don't take family planning seriously. So, you know, so the aid givers don't, and it's really the NGOs, Gates Foundation and so forth who pr promote it. So there's something we can do. We can do a lot. It will help the Africans, future Africans, because they're growing at a very fast rate population wise, and that's creating pressure on their ecosystems. So it's in their interest, but quite apart from that, it's empowering, empowering women. So even if you start from a much more primitive notion of the good, in the basic, when I say primitive, and basic, how fundamental, that people should be empowered, have power over their own bodies, control over their own bodies. This is what we're talking about here. Then it seems to me to ignore these aspects of proper pattern is really bad science. Never mind the ethics involved. So that review goes into that as well. And I'm hoping that, you know, there will be some things which are quite cheap. And family planning is very cheap relative to many other things like women's education. That's much more expensive. So the routes to empowerment 
we've got used to the idea that only education, that's the thing that matters because it's comfortable. It doesn't take you into <laughs> how, how can you be against education? By the way, that's not quite true. There are societies where males don't like women to be educated as we know from, but never mind that. Okay. So the, if you really try to go into all these in detail, some of them can be enacted, uh, but what will be, I can't tell. All I can say is that I was, um, the Treasury was a remarkable host to my review. They made no demands on what I wrote, absolutely nothing at all. They gave me an amazingly creative uh, team, amazingly good team. And, uh, and they, it's a collaborative venture between my team and I in producing the review. And uh, so, I mean, all I can say is that it's been a great, fantastic experience doing this and I've tried to repay the debt I owed them by producing as honest a piece as I could. What they do with it is something I can't predict. Thank you. Um, I would like to um, thank you all for um, participating here, all the attendees, and of course, especially uh, Parta and Yuan for your uh, very valuable contribution to, to this uh, webinar and providing a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I'm sorry, we run a little bit over time, but uh, the discussion was so interesting. Um, so I blame you a little bit, the, the both of you, that we uh, spend a little bit more time because you were so good at uh, discussion. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.